Today, I have the pleasure of interviewing Faz from Faz Lifts. He has a growing YouTube presence and uh, Instagram presence. He is located out of Derby in the UK, which I'm told is about two and a half hours from London for uh, all of the uh, Americans that are geographically illiterate, such as myself. Uh, Faz, welcome to the show. Hey, really appreciate you having me on. So, uh, pleasure to be here. Yeah. Absolutely, man. I'm happy you could uh, make time. Mm-hmm. I wanted to get a little bit of an introduction to you. We just did the round table about West Side with Steve mm-hmm. Shaw and Alex from Alpha Destiny. And I did a little bit of a go over on your channel, but you have a lot of content out already, as I understand you're a little new to YouTube. You have a ton of content out. Give everybody a little bit of an insight into what your background is, uh, how you approach training, and what you're kind of bringing to the YouTube space right now. Gotcha. So um, I've been a competitive athlete for about 20 years in all of the, the major strength sports. So powerlifting, strongman, and bodybuilding, most of my experience in powerlifting. Um, and I've been coaching for about six years. So I've been on YouTube for about one year. And what I want to try and do is to um, disseminate the information that I found, which allows me to do the sport, which I really love, and allows people to get involved with it and do well with it, improve their bodies, improve their health, uh, and just get jacked and strong, which is great. So uh, that's really what I love to do. Um, Before, well, during the time that I was an athlete, I also worked as a school teacher. So that was my previous profession. And so pretty much my entire life has been spent helping people and disseminating information to them. And that's kind of very similar to what I do now in my capacity as a coach and also on YouTube. It's really the same thing. Um, it, and you get the same pleasure in seeing people succeed. So it's a lot of what I'm about. Yeah, learning how to educate others is huge. And I think it's missing in a lot of coaches. What uh, levels did you teach? I taught from 11 to 18 years old. So that over here, that's uh, key stage three, four, and five. Over there, it might be something else, yeah. Well, that's great because I think a lot of clients you come across are are better suited if you treat them as pre-teenagers. <laughs> um, that's, uh, I, I came across your YouTube page in the banner. It said, uh, experience, honesty, knowledge. I believe that's what it said on the back. Mm. And that's huge. I mean, without it sounding too trite, it's something that's obviously missing from the space. Everybody knows it. I had made a comment to you that most of us get into this because there's something we see that rubs us the wrong way. And there's a lot of gimmicky shit that goes on uh, in the training space. Uh, Do you have any, um, I don't know, anything that sticks in your craw about modern um, fitness culture, anything you see with your clients or online that you're kind of on a mission against? So I had a comment fairly recently from one of my usual subscribers. And he said, I really enjoy your content. Uh, you know, it's really good to see you out here spreading the good word. And he said, it's a shame that you, you might never get really, really big because to do that, you have to really sell your soul and do all the advertising and do a lot of the fake stuff. Um, and uh, I, I thought about that for a while because I'm not sure how to take that. It's kind of like a compliment, but also it's a bit of a, a bit of a downer. And, and um, I realized, well, I kind of, I kind of came to the conclusion that, that I'm not sure it's that much of a concern for me because my YouTube is really just an extension of my coaching and my coaching is designed to help people. So I don't mind that. I'm not a particularly flashy gimmicky channel specifically because I'm trying to help people learn and, you know, actually get results. So it's just not my audience, I suppose, is probably the, the, the thing that I would, my reply to that. I mean, I, I just said, thanks very much. And I appreciate it. But my, what, what I'm actually thinking is I'm not really sure I want to be like huge 1 million subs type of person because um, the goal is just to help. And so if I can help my clients, if I can have a bigger outreach to help more people, then that's really what it's about. So I'm not sure that's really my world. I don't have any sort of opinions really massively about the Greg Doucette's of the world or, or whoever else. I, I really don't. I mean, he's fine. He's doing his thing and that's cool. But it, it's just not something I, it's, that is massively on my radar. And maybe that's only because I've been on YouTube for about a year. Perhaps if I've been here for longer, perhaps I'll be looking more at those channels and trying to compare. But right now, those kind of accounts just aren't on my radar. Guys like yourself, uh, Jeffrey Verity Schofield, Alpha Destiny, Steve Shaw, um, that's more my sort of circle. And I think what's common amongst all of us is we're just looking to help people understand, get better results. We're all coaches as well. Um, So yeah, I suppose if I was to sit back and think about it, uh, maybe it would annoy me more. But um, right now, it's just, it's not massively on my radar. Yeah, I think that's a good way to be. Uh, you have your way or, or your values that you want to project. 
And it is, I think, wholly useless to worry too much about what others are doing, unless it's, unless it's something obvious that influences your audience that you have to find yourself correcting over and over. It's always interesting for me to talk to people who are in a similar boat, not just with lifting, but coaching and then trying to use these platforms to make a career out of it. Because there are like two paths. There's a, there's this seemingly fork in the road. You have to decide, am I going to stick to my guns and worry about what I'm doing and apply a little bit of integrity? Or am I going to try to run the algorithm into the ground and, and see this meteoric rise? I, when I, I like to think anyways, the integrity route, and I can't even call it that. It's just applying what I know works and trying to explain things in somewhat simple terms. And that did nothing but work out well for me. I mean, that was that's what kept me going was the positive feedback I got year one. And I don't think I'd be here if I wasn't getting that. So I think that's a, a better way to do it for sure, especially if you know how to already monetize your channel. And the internet is so fill, uh, filled with the other superfluous gimmicky stuff that even if you go that route, you don't stand out. There's nothing special. You know, we're at a weird time where where being good and educated and knowledgeable is special enough to stand out. So I think you're on the you're on the right track, anyways. Yeah, I, I think I think your channel is mostly an extension of your coaching. So, like, I from day one when I was a, as a coach, I always looked to give people as much information as possible, not trying to hold anything back, just to give them the full picture, in the hopes that if I give them everything they need, they'll stay with me anyway. Not in this sort of trying, try not not trying to get them into this sort of ball and chain relationship where I'm edging them on week in week out and they're paying me more money. But uh, I'll tell you, going back to your first question, I'll tell you one thing that did um, sort of get me a little bit annoyed was one of my current clients before he came to me um he he believes he attributes some of his um disordered eating patterns to one i won't name his name but one very famous coach online who says something along the lines of um i think it was if you can't see your abs you're fat something like that yeah okay and so this contributed to his disordered eating and he's actually very angry about that now because he was a young impressionable guy at the stage at the time and it contributed to um some disordered eating him staying at a low body weight far too for far too long and contributed to some poor eating habits so he's pretty angry about that now and i've i've got him on the right track he's you know he's he's gaining some good weight he's gaining some good strength and that's all great um but i think he feels like he missed out on 6 months of giving himself a hard time unnecessarily for that. So I guess there are, this is, this is it, Alex. Uh, maybe it's a different conversation, but one of the things that um, people talk about all the time is giving advice and stuff. And I know you've got a separate channel for that. And I think that's cool. But like, I think when, when I was a school teacher, one of the first things that we were taught was you're, you're in a position of authority. You have to be very careful with the advice that you give out because it can really have an impact on people. Like there's a level of responsibility if you're a person of authority. And I think giving people out like information like that, like the whole, if you are uh, if you don't have abs, you're fat kind of thing, potentially giving people advice about their lives and all that kind of stuff within off the back of your, your personality or your achievements in sports, it's a very dangerous game. Um, and I think it's all well and good saying, well, you know, you're an adult, you can make your own decisions and everything, but um, these things have very real consequences. And, and I, one of the reasons I just don't give a lot of, you know, actual social, like psychological advice and life advice on my, on my channel is um, it scares the hell out of me, to be honest. <laughs> you know, I, it's, it's a big responsibility. So I, I'm, I'm 40. So I've got plenty of life experience. I feel like I can divulge. But um, if, what if I put someone wrong? I mean, I'm not talking from a legality point of view because there's not really much comeback there. But what if I put someone in the wrong direction? They do something wrong. And how am I going to sleep with myself at night? It's, it's a, it's a, it's a difficult thing. And I think people do that a lot there. There's a lot out there now, which is, you know, I'm this person on YouTube. I want to give you life advice. Uh, and, uh, it's fine for them. I'm not judging anyone, but it scares the hell out of me. No, it is a big responsibility. Mm-hmm. And I find that when I do broach those topics and I try to do it right, whatever that means you have to, if you're imagining some potentially vulnerable person sitting in front of you, you're talking to many of them all with different issues to try to cast such a wide net that it becomes meaningful to all of them. It kind of becomes meaningful to none of them. And you end up having to add so many qualifiers of what you're saying that you end up not really saying anything. So that really gets exaggerated when you have these channels that want to make not just a a wide sweeping statement, but it's an absolutist statement and it's blown up the way you blow things up when you want to get a lot of attention or add to your brand. And it can get really ugly. 
And the conversation has always interested me more than the dogma of like kind of pushing a perspective or point of view, but it is ugly business. And for every person that's out there looking for something to grab onto to give them a little bit of stability that might help them, there's the potential person that will misinterpret it, that will take it too far. The body dysmorphia thing is really hard in this field because, and especially you train bodybuilders, you deal with this day in, day out. One of my, the best man in my wedding, uh, Tony Russell, he's, he's a bodybuilder. He's done it for years. He grades women by how he thinks they would do if they tried to go pro. Uh, it, it's been a big part of his life. And he's the first one to say, he's like, bodybuilders aren't okay. <laughs> he's like, you got to be a little bit off your rocker to do this stuff. And when you take that personality type and then you add a bunch of kind of superfluous arbitrary standards, it's a recipe for putting yourself in a bad spot. And we already have a society that has an unhealthy relationship with food and we use it to self-medicate. And now you're adding these weird standards like, and I get irked, I mean, from that, like, yeah, it's dangerous. But then as just somebody who's trying to get people stronger, like you can't do that when people are trying to stay at 140 pounds, you know, when they're, they're grown adult men. And I deal with a lot of that, the trying to get people to gain weight is such a chore nowadays. It is. There was something that you said on uh, the podcast with Steve that I thought was really good. And it was, uh, you said, when you're speaking on YouTube, you try and envision a room, you speaking to a room full of your peers and how you would moderate yourself. And I thought that was really clever. It's fantastic. I love that. Um, because I often think the conversations we have online, which tend to get quite heated, I wonder if we could just displace everyone and put them into a pub with a pint. Um, would, it would be a much friendlier discussion. Um, so yeah, I, I really like that. I thought I wanted to point that out with uh, today. I think about stuff like that a lot. It's funny you bring that up. I forget what I was listening to, but it was somebody talking about, uh, it was an Englishman, I believe, talking about, I think it was Pierce Morgan. I was listening to an interview with Pierce Morgan. He was on Bill Maher. And uh, he was talking about growing up with a family that owned a pub. And they were talking about the cultural differences of drinking culture, which is like the great social lubricant and it's, uh, it's what discussion is based off of. And he was talking about pubs as this like, it's intergenerational and it's a place where the community goes and you'll have old timers and you'll have young people and you'll have, it, like people will grow up going to the same pub with the same people. And out here, it's very much, it's even segregated out here by, well, this is the nightclub. This is for young people. This is the hipster bar. It's like the old people go over here and it's kind of whack. You don't go over there, but it's, that idea of trying to get people's conversations in one place, there's a cohesiveness to that that I like that is very much, I think, missing from most of our dialogue. Whether you want to talk about technical stuff related to lifting, whether you want to talk about mental health or social or political topics, um, that I think really does us a, a disservice from that perspective. Yeah, for sure. I, I think a large part of it, people are just out of practice, you know? And uh, if the, the last few years has taught us anything, it's people are there's a lot of people who have developed um, sort of anxiety like symptoms um but not full-blown anxiety like and i i sympathize as, a, as that as an actual diagnosis but a lot of people are more anxious in speaking to each other simply because they're just not used to doing it so mm -hmm. they've been indoors for two or three years and um, it's like you're saying if, if we were more able and more willing to just all be in one room and speak to each other and be forced to do that face-to-face -face in a civilized manner, it, it would probably lead to people adapting far better to being able to have a conversation with somebody else with a different viewpoint. Like on my, on my Facebook, I quite like having people with different viewpoints. So it's quite nice. I have people with different um, political beliefs, religious beliefs. Um, I have some with, you know, some strange beliefs because it's, it's quite nice to have the interaction. I think it's good. I think you should always open yourself up to those as long as it's done in a civilized way, but it's practice. If you can't practice doing that, it, you're always going to be sheltered. And then when you go online, um, you're not going to be able to deal with all these different opinions. You'll get angry and it's very, very easy online just to beep, beep, beep and log off yeah. and have a, have a nice day, you know, feel like you've got the upper hand. Yeah. Um, but I, I think it's just a lack of practice. No, that's absolutely right. And because internet and social media culture selects for, those very polarized viewpoints, regardless of what the topic is and all the anger and rage and, that comes with it. We almost end up taking that out into the real world where I, I don't know if anybody else has experienced this. I find myself a little more hesitant to have kind of normal conversations with people because there's almost this learned anticipation that things go off the rails. If you get out of this, uh, this very tightly controlled path of conversation and you do need practice. And I always recommend that people 
have some idea of what the other side believes that is it's indicative of something that you have intellectual respect for mm -hmm. as opposed to just having your worst kind of bad faith interpretation of what other people think one of the reasons i made this new channel that i just created is so i could talk about a lot of different shit i did a on my main channel i did a thing on um, testosterone in america and of course there were some social and political implications and I had this long thread that was taken up. I guess I have like a lot of Marxists that follow me. I had a bunch of like, and they were, you know, throwing their, their jargon around in the comments. And I am decidedly not a Marxist. I am a, an unabashed American capitalist. But we had this like amazing conversation that I had to cut short because it was taking up too much of my day, you know, yes. but, but when it actually gets into the weeds and you get into it, you can find some really good things. Uh, even if you don't come to an agreement, you don't have to, at least you have an understanding and, and that's a big part of it. And then it, bringing that back to training culture, so much of it is finger wagging and people putting their dogmatic flag on this or that. Now, that was the interesting thing about a ran, a round table, because I wasn't sure off the bat. I'm like, why are we talking about Westside? I didn't know that you and Alex had actually uh, incorporated those principles into your training. Um, do you want to talk a little bit about how you structure your workouts and what principles you take from that? Yeah, so I can um, nowadays, if it comes to my advanced um, strength clients, I pretty much all have them training in the conjugate style, but with some principles that we were discussing to do with sort of continuity of exercises uh, and some linearity there. So when I was full on into powerlifting, my sort of last few years, I was very much a high frequency trainer. And uh, I look back and I think potentially had I done more rotational lifts, I added in a little bit more variety, I could have potentially saved myself from a few injuries and potentially got even a little bit further. And so that's kind of how I try to structure clients' workouts now, and that seems to work quite well. So as a basic structure, I tend to work in three-week blocks, three-week waves. Now, what I like to do is I like to string together a bunch of waves. So I'll talk you through what I'm doing with a client at the moment. So the general plan is we're looking to string together, if we just take the... Um, the deadlift for the, for the time being. So what I like to do is I like to rotate the max effort lifts pretty much every week. So it's one, two, three, and then the same again, one, two, three. So they get to retest the max lift every third or fourth week. Okay. But throughout the secondary exercise remains the same. So the secondary exercise in this case is going to be a deficit stiff leg deadlift without a belt. So a very, very hard variation of the deadlift. Now, over the course of the next three to maybe six weeks, so the next block or two, I go on to the third and fourth block where I'll make that variation a little bit more specific. And bear in mind that variation is the one consistent variation throughout every week. You're going to hit that. It's the consistency. You can measure your progress against that. So you might be doing that for three to six weeks of progress right the way through. Then the next three to six week block will be stiff leg deadlifts, potentially with a belt from the floor, not a deficit. And then the final three to six weeks might be a full deadlift with some type of variation just so it's not a max um, deadlift, maybe with some, maybe a repetition effort or maybe with some bands. But the point is to go from having a very difficult variation right the way through to a harder and harder variation, to a more specific variation over the course of say, anywhere between nine to say 18 weeks. So that way you actually have consistency bred through and you can judge your performance, but you're also taking advantage of maxing on things which build special strengths and just getting, and still feeling used to lifting heavy weight. Cause I think that's important. Yeah. And that all sounds exceptional. And as I talk to people such as yourself that have found workarounds, even someone like Matt Wenning, who I might have disagreements with on certain points, mm. uh, in Dave Tate, I have an immense amount of respect for how they've been able to take it and kind of fill in some of the gaps and make it more digestible for people. The continuity, I think, is the biggest thing that that is an asset. And I think that's a great add-on to the, the framework. And I think that's one of the most critical things uh, that I could comment on with regards to kind of run of the mill, what you would think of as, oh, as yeah. West side style training. I'm curious how you, um, how you handle the max effort work. Do you go for a true max? Do you uh, do a buildup over those waves uh, or, or use RPE to regulate, or do you just tell them to go for broke? It's, it's kind of RP, RPE 9.5. 9 okay. I don't think it's necessary to go all the way. I have some clients who are a little bit crazy and they go all the way and I, I don't mind that as long as they understand the risk involved. The way that I was always taught, Alex, was if I could take a weight confidently and I knew 
I could do an extra five kilos because you know, really, don't you? After you've had a, a max lift, you think, okay, I could have had five kilos. And some days you get out by the skin of your teeth and you think there's no way I could have got any more than that. You know, you don't have to take the weight. And let's face it, what is the benefit of taking that weight? You could potentially argue there's some benefit in learning how to fail in grinding. I don't think the risk to reward ratio is worthwhile. So I feel 95% is enough. I don't feel we need to go to failure. Um, occasionally clients will and I just try to get them not to do that on the more dangerous lifts. Um, but what I'll do is, um, yeah, we'll go for a single up to about 95%. The back off will be on the consistent lift throughout. Yeah. The, the discussion about um, not even just training to failure, but like gauging RPEs mm. is one that I am constantly infuriated by because it's something <laughs> that is so necessary to talk about and is seemingly so simple. Uh, and I agree with you that, that I know and you know, and I'm sure many of your clients know, but one of the big things that makes me routinely want to quit online coaching is the difficulty I have either explaining it to people or getting them to fall right into the pocket. Now that's not all their fault. It changes dramatically from person to person. I know people that will grind at an RP six and continue to grind all the way up to a max. And it looks pretty similar. They're like human forklifts. And I know other people that are explosive. You can put 500 pounds on their back and they'll pop it up. And then 505, you know, goes up and comes right back down. So there's a lot of variation, makes it very hard to deal with. Um, and it almost seems like you need safeguards. So I have a lot of people that still try to infuse the 90% training max that Wendler made popular, which, you know, fair enough. But then you're trying to do like inception layers of, of well, this is what I think you can do. And this is what we're working with. And it's like, anyways, it gets very challenging. Do you have any mechanisms you use to try to standardize that effort? Or do you kind of leave it up to the interpretation of the people you coach? I'll, I'll be honest with you. And I'll just, I'll just say this. Um, when Mike T first came out with the RPE scale, I hated it. I absolutely <laughs> hate it. I rejected it for such a long time. I just hate it. It was not, it just wasn't the language we used back then. Um, so I hated it. And I, yeah, I've never said that in public before, but I love Mike T. He's great. Can't pronounce his surname for the life of me, but I love him. But like his, I, I just rejected the RPE scale for ages. Um, but what I realized when I started coaching was you need to have a language. That's what it's all about. You need to have a language. You need to be able to speak the same. Like for, the, for you and I to sit here and discuss in shorthand what we mean about taking a lift to the limit or keeping a bit in the tank, we need to have some type of language. And then an advancement of that language, we need to have a scale to say, okay, well, how far off are we? How close are we? So the more I coach people, and this was coaching either in person or coaching um, sort of long distances online, the more I realized it was just a language. And I've been on this push recently on my channel about RIR. And it's for the same reason. It's, it's a necessary evil. Like if I'm coaching people online, if we're discussing things in a uniform sense, we need to have a language. In, in the same way, um, 12 years ago, 15 years ago, um, in hypertrophy research, uh, Matt Matthias Wormbaum measured volume in number of repetitions. Now, we don't do that anymore. It's crazy. In fact, now we're talking about effective reps. So the last five reps maybe is what we should be counting. But the thing is, we need a language to be able to advance these discussions so I hated Mike T's RPE to begin with, but I've really come to appreciate as I coach more and more, we need to have a language because if we don't, then we are starting afresh with every person, with every client I have. I need to start from the ground up to say, hey, um, I want you to lift to be this way. And there's far too much room for error and it takes too long. So it, it, it pays in a field like ours to have a universal language. So I have bent to the RIR and our RPE um, uh, juggernauts and uh, so yeah I am well into that so I guess the first thing that I would do for clients is and this is part of my push on my YouTube recently is to explain what RIR is the value in it why we use it because I think ultimately when people hear RIR they just think easy work um, they did and just blanket to go up oh, that's just easy work we don't just take it to failure all the time and that's that's the way forward and it was the same the way that I thought of RPE I just didn't think I just thought it was I just really misunderstood it initially and I never used it for the first few years so when I discuss it now, I do, I do like to put an RP on it, but if it's with clients, I will explain it further. So in the case of a recent client pulling, who's pulling a, a deadlift, um, I will just say to him, look, go all out. Don't go to the point where you're going to hurt yourself. <laughs> it's, it's, something, it's more descriptive and it, it, it's going gonna, it's gonna to resonate differently with different people because I can tell him 9.5. 
but I also have to add that in because I know his personality and he's very reckless. He's very aggressive. He's very big. He's very strong. With others, I might have to say, go to 9.5, push yourself a little bit. Maybe just leave it all on the platform here. So there's a bit of uh, explanation, but I think the starting point of the language is, is crucial. I'm, I'm fully into that now. I think you have to have a language to speak to, about these features. Yeah, there's no way around that learning curve. I mean, psychology, like you just said, that's a huge point. I have j probably just as many people that refuse to push the effort where I have to kind of coax or trick them into working hard. You know, their governor is on a little too hard and they're leaving stuff on the table. I have probably just as many of those as the number of people who are an imminent threat to their own safety. Yes. Uh, I have one kid, uh, shout out to Justin Kims, one of my clients. Um, I told him to do an RP eight deadlift for like a top set of five. And he sent me, he's like, yeah, these move pretty well. And he sent me, it was a 50 second long video where he was taking, you know, eight to 10 seconds in between each rep. It looked like a series of singles and he didn't even, lock, <laughs> he didn't lock the last one out. So oh, effectively gosh. it was like 95% he did for a set of five and I had to have this long lecture and there's no way around that. You have to learn what RP is some way. So I guess those moments you overreach are, are still valuable in the grand scheme of things. There's no perfect way to get it without, I think, bleeding outside of the lines a little bit, but I spent so much time trying to interpret percentage-based programs when I was younger and not really understanding how how this specific arrangement of weight sets and reps would work over the entire period of time. Like how hard were you supposed to be working? How, um, how would that, how was that effort supposed to change? Was everything supposed to be just as hard? And especially how does that encompass everybody? Because anybody who follows this one percentage based program is going to experience that weight differently. And it took quite a while before I intuited that, Oh, well, that's just something they didn't try to account for that, that the percentage presupposes an RPE given a certain max, and that's kind of baked in. And if it doesn't line up with where you, where you're at, it's like, well, you know, tough shit, just keep your fingers crossed and uh, hope for the best. Yeah. They always used to crush me. I, I fell out of favor with the uh, percentage based programs very early on until I learned to do my own percentages. For me, uh, the percentages I built on were a lot lower. Than what I eventually ended up as a max with, whatever that means for my uh, lifting prowess. But I peaked a 255 squat off a 180 for eight uh, set. So my ability to max was far in excess of my ability to rep, but I really like reps. I responded well to them. So training was very unusual. I, I didn't like to spend very long at the high percentages um, because I would get beat up really quickly. Um, I, I do think I'm not really, uh, despite my numbers, I'm not sure I'm built for strength, but very small joints and everything, sort of light structure. I'm probably built more for bodybuilding. But uh, for the strength I peaked, I managed to do it off a lot of repetition work. And I seemed to get really good carryover in singles. So on, in the early days, I was getting crushed by these percentage programs because they were far higher, probably 10% probably higher than I needed. So every time it got to the max, I was already burnt out, never worked out for me. And so most of the time, I just learned to learn my own language and I learned to work more intuitively. And that was really the where I got my strongest was when I did mostly intuitive training. That's a different dimension of complexity that layers on top of it. I mean, there's mm. let's standardize how hard you're actually working relative to the other guy. Now let's try to figure out whether or not you need to work that hard or that heavy, given all of your predispositions. And I just had, it wasn't until recently and I'd kind of heard it before, but it didn't really click when I was trying to figure out how to massage programs for different people. We're all trying to predict what's going to happen with a new client and it rarely goes the way we want it to. And there's trial and error involved and so on. But hearing like Josh Bryant talk about like fast gainers and slow gainers, um, considering what explosive athletes can probably get away with when I consider someone like, uh, Chad Smith, right. Who was a huge squatter. And he routinely said, I won't get within a hundred pounds of my opener going into a meet. It's all sub max rep work. And he gets these huge swings on the back end and he can recover from them. Whereas somebody else might absolutely require all of the heavy, like neurologically specific work. And I think that's the thing that fascinates me. That's the thing I wish science was trying to attack and predict and, and, kind of uh, standardized, but I don't think we're, uh, I don't think we're anywhere near those studies becoming a thing. 
Yeah, I, I that was that was so, I was a bit more like Chad. Um, so in my early days, before I really got into powerlifting, sort of towards the end, um, I would take a deload and I would come back stronger. So it was, it, and I would I could train up until the point where I couldn't lift anything close to what I was lifting the previous week. So I remember days before needing a deload, going in not even be able to lift a two plate deadlift off the floor. I was just so wiped. And then I take a deload week and I'd actually come back stronger and hit a PR. So my early training was very unusual, but it, it was very specific to me and it worked quite well. I deloaded a lot more than people normally recommend. And this was back in 2002. Have you heard of a strength coach called Dan John? Yeah. Yeah. I've read yeah. some of his books. Dan's great. So I went back in 2002, I had just come out of my sort of beginner phase. I've been training for a couple of years. I had reasonable lifts. So about a 200 bench, um, reasonable three three fifty squat and about a 400 deadlift and i was a i'd been competing i'd competed a couple of times already uh, with that embarrassing bench so and i couldn't push it further and even despite weight gain and everything else i just couldn't push it further and i was very much a low volume trainer i came from the hard gainer school do you remember those guys yeah god absolute absolute uh, horrible horrible school of thought and i actually used to write for them as well terrible stuff but anyway i so then i started to explore because i realized that just wasn't working the low volume stuff and i emailed dan john and I said, look, Dan, um, I just keep getting hurt or injured. I'm not progressing. What do I do? And um, I didn't know because I was just some kid from Derby, England, that Dan John, this huge Dan John, messaged me back. And he did. He messaged me back that very afternoon. And he, and he told me, he said, um, yeah, this is what you do. Look in your training diary and just try and figure out when, if there's a pattern for when you get injured, when you get ill, when do things go wrong? And I was like, okay, Dan, I'll do that. Went away, checked my logs, paper records for the past three years checked them all. And lo and behold, every third week, something would happen. I'd get snapped up. I'd get ill. Cause you know, what it's like when you're young, you don't really get hurt. You just get ill. And so something would happen. I was like, Dan emailed it back. This is what happens. I said, okay, great. Every third week I went to deload. And that was the best run of training that I had. I would just train like an absolute maniac for two weeks. Everything was heavy max singles, heavy max fives, uh, some back off works in the 10, but not much. Everything was to fail yeah, pretty much except for the singles. And then I would need a deload every third week, come back and I'd be stronger. And in that sort of 18 months, that was probably the best run of strength that I had ever. Um, so but that was something that, that worked for me very early on. Well, that was one of the, the brilliant pieces that uh, Mike T, uh, to sheer, I believe it's pronounced, ah, uh, okay. uh, brought, to the, brought to the game was he evaluated what uh, the coach uh, Bondarchuk did with flat loading. And that was basically doing the exact same amount of work each week and using that as your baseline. Because if you're following the same RP for the same exercises for the same reps, the only way the weight goes up is if you got stronger and if you're recovered, right? So he would recommend in his uh, emerging, emergent training strategies, I think he called it, he would recommend doing this initial flat loading with his clients where you're literally doing the exact same workout and we're going to find the week where everything falls off. And that's what your training blocks are. And it might be three weeks for some people, it might be six for some people, but it apparently works out as this very, uh, very efficient method of figuring out where that happens. And I think that's one thing that, that nobody really pays attention to until they've gone through the growing pains of having really shitty runs of training. You know, after the point where you're strong, where you're slowly starting to realize that what you did in the beginning will never work again and you have to evolve and do something else. And for a while, we did just the blanket, you know, deload every fourth week and that was it. And I think that's pretty good. I don't think people are going to be worse off for doing that. Mm -hmm. But if you can pinpoint the week that it happens, that that's just a recipe for more efficiency, less loss training. Yeah, that's, that's how I still do it with my clients now. So I have a general uh, theme of deloading every potentially fourth or sixth, fourth to sixth week, but uh, it very much depends on when the client sort of burns out. And so we kind of just base it on week to week feedback and week to week feelings. Um, but I'm still very much a fan of deloads. After my initial stint of deloads, I did experiment with some stuff by Chad Wesley Smith and looking at uh, loading the intensity across the course of the month to enable me to carry on training and not have to deload thoroughly. So deload being a representing a very, very much lowered amount of work. Um, I, it just didn't work as well for me. So I would measure sort of medium weeks, high weeks, medium weeks, potentially a low week, but still all pretty much around medium. Didn't really work as well for me. I felt like I needed to really push 
the on weeks very, very high to get the adaptation period necessary. But I couldn't maintain that. So I had to work at a at a level where I just couldn't maintain it for any long period of time. And that was what I needed to actually spur on new gains. Um, I think if people can do it on a more gradual approach by training more often and for longer, then that's okay. But it's not something that ever worked for me. So I'm still very much on the deload train. I, I like it. I'll, I'll defend it till till I retire. I think it's a, it's a good way to go. Um, and I think there are other reasons why the deloads tend to be quite useful as well. I think there are certain areas of the body which aren't really going to give you a great deal of feedback before they snap, uh, like ligaments and tendons. And I think it's quite a good catch-all there. I had a conversation with a British coach um, a couple of years ago. It was, it was him and his his coach. And I was defending deloads and they were replying back and saying, it's, it's quite useful if um, you're inexperienced and you don't really connect well with your clients. So, and it's it really kind of condescending sort of conversation. And I was like, oh, really, this is not what I meant. I meant that actually, you know, you can, there are some things that don't give you feedback because a, a dealer, a reactive dealer is based on feedback from the body, but some things don't give you feedback. And um, he just carried on that line of thought. And, and then the next week, his client blew his quad off the bone. I'm like, whoa, there you go. <laughs> um, not saying that was the cause, of course, but I mean, it was just an interesting coincidence, but I think it's quite a nice safeguard. Uh, that's also another thing. And if you are working with somebody who potentially you don't know that well, you've maybe worked with them for less than six months, then it's, it's quite a nice tactic. So I, I'm, I'm definitely still a very big fan of that type of load variation. Yeah. And you're, you hit the nail on the head there. I mean, feedback, a good training run is not going to rely entirely on feedback because by the time you get the feedback, it's too late, right? Like you don't, you don't wait until you're beat up before you're like, oh shit, I need to take a deload right now. And I think a lot of people underplay how prevalent injuries are, which are probably preventable and will eventually sideline you in your training. And if you could put a filter on all the people you consider, if somebody has been training, let's say more than six or eight years, if they're competitive, if they're consistent, if they have hungry goals, you're going to see a big ballooning up, I think, in injury frequency and severity compared to the rest of the population. And as more is on the line, you need more and more to try to, you know, be the guy wire to pull that back in the other direction. So another point going into like how you prefer to train, given what's worked for you, it made me think of the learning curves that exist with these different forms of training and that training isn't really just training, right? It's everything you do has its own texture and boundaries that you have to come to know. And no matter how good or experienced you are, if you change the thing that you're relying on to grow you suddenly it's a different ball game and it feels like you're new and you're trying to to manage all of these variables in your head which is very hard to do i've tried to chart like the origins of that style of training like chad smith we were talking about like small and medium and heavy and it makes sense and it obviously works for the people that do it and that's very much derived from olympic lifting because olympic lifting coaches don't have uh typically hard deloads. Everything is just, you're, it's like, you're, you're just treading water as you go down the river, you know, everything's big, small, it's adjusting up and down as you go. And you just get your recovery kind of organically as you go through these huge swings and volume and intensity and it can work, but damn it. Are there a ton of moving pieces that probably has the steepest learning curve of anything you can, you can engage with. Whereas if you can come up with a way that says, get some good quality, hard work in show that there is some direction, some linearity to it, and then take a break before your body gets exhausted. That seems more intuitive and user-friendly, especially if you're trying to manage uh, a big population of people. And in that way, man, you're, you're almost pulling me back on the, the conjugate train. I'm going to have to, I'm going to have to second guess some of my, some of my hardline uh, lines in the sand that I've been glued to in the past. I, I do understand where you're coming from with that though, because I went through all that with conjugate as well. And, and it's, it's like I said on the podcast, it was shoved down our throats for so long. Uh, <laughs> everyone was on the train, every Tom, Dick and Harry, as soon as he got into Palatine, was like, yeah, West Side. And so it, it did get tiring very early on, very quick. I, I feel like I've sort of come back in love with it over the years, particularly as I've gotten older and I've gotten injured and I don't want that to happen to my clients. So yeah, I've been back on the conjugate train and it's worked well. But um, yeah, with regards to what you're saying just now, the other part that makes this also difficult is it's all very dynamic. It's a very dynamic system too. Uh, when you're getting stronger, something you get strong, 
your system's working, great. Then something in the system breaks. <laughs> then you've got to fix that, get a little bit stronger. It's like, it's, you're like going up in ladders. So it's, it's dynamic all the time. So I, I do, yeah, again, quite like the idea of, of having the deloads and, and having that as a set stand, line in the sand to say, let's look back at the last, say, six weeks or five weeks, evaluate what happened, evaluate what worked well, what didn't, and you have these set points. And I do that with my bodybuilding clients too, my physique clients, look back on blocks of trading and go, let's just figure out what went right here, what went wrong. And I think it's a nice checkpoint for people just to say, okay, this is where we're at. Um, yeah. With the, um, the kind of West side slash conjugate uh, system breaking into the mainstream, I think one of the biggest things that probably did it a disservice, maybe not in its initial marketing and how prolific it became, but at least as far as it being useful to so many of the people that got pulled into it, I think that the dogma is uh, probably what did the biggest disservice to the program. Mm -hmm. And I think we have a lot of people to thank for making it more accessible, like the Matt Winnings, the Dave Tates. And these are people that lived around Louis, rest in peace, who was known for being, you know, very, he had a very hardline personality and it was part of his charm. And it was probably why he was a good coach, but it was also something that worked against him in a lot of ways but they for the longest time were like his interpreters. So when he would speak, right, it's like you needed somebody to fill in the gaps or kind of take you around the corner and be like, okay, so what he said about this, just kind of forget that. But everything else over here was, was dead on. And that's the first thing that goes off my head when I talk to you and when I talk to, to Alex from Alpha Destiny was the, the feedback I get from people that do it and love it. It usually comes with liberal tinkering. Oh yeah. Many, many much of which, kind of defies the initial dogmatic recommendation. And, you know, it has to be done uh, this way and that way. But that I wanted to ask you about um, some of the linear elements of your training, mm -hmm. because going hard at the certain RPE, you know, that sweet spot where it's effort and you're grinding, but you're not going to snap yourself up doing that week in week out over the variations, throwing in a deload uh, when it's appropriate. That makes sense. Seems relatively easy to follow. When you go to the secondary exercise and you have this continuity lift that you have run through how do you choose the weights and reps initially what ranges do you like and how do you how do you program in the progression for that thread of progress okay so yeah there it takes very much from my bodybuilding experience so um i i i, I coach a lot of bodybuilders and it i borrow directly from that stuff so if we were to sort of linearly take a portion of of the program let's say we would take um I don't know, bench pressing. Let's just take that. The bulk of it is going to be repetition work on variations. So it's going to be one of the longstanding variations. Now, within the course of those three to six weeks, we're going to try and improve with a certain number of sets within a rep range. I've not got to the point yet where I want to increase volume over the course of three weeks. That is an option that I do with my bodybuilding clients because I think you're adding a lot of stress to the tendons there in a potentially chaotic kind of way, particularly when you're ramming 95% singles on top of that as well. So I don't think that's worth the trade-off, but I do encourage them to add weight to the bar, more of a double progression type of thing. So we'll, for the main variations, I like to use up to five to 10 reps. It's a good way to go. Uh, it's pretty much perfect. I like to keep them at about one or two reps in reserve. So, you know, RP nine, something like that. Um, so the sets could look like, you know, nine for the first set, maybe seven for the second set, five for the third set, same weight and just descending reps because they get tired. Um, so that's the main assistance for say the bench press. On the second day, there'll usually be some type of um, volume work, normally five by five. I have done the whole five by five, eight by eight, 10 by 10 thing. Um, it works, it does. Um, when you get to the tens, it just feels like, you just don't have to go quite that far. It just seems a bit much. Mm -hmm. um, it's good because of the repetition, but it seems superfluous, like it's unnecessary. So I generally stick to five by five. But what I do like to do is if, it's, if, if you've got a guy who's still got plenty of room to gain, so let's say late stage intermediate, I'll probably have him uh, cycling that in three weeks. So he might go 100, 110, 120. First week of the next block, he might start at 105. So every three weeks, we're looking at progressing about five kilos, 10 pounds. That's a pretty decent rate of progression. So we're never really going all out, but it's just that repetition work. It's fast, one minute rest periods, nice and snappy, but it's volume work. So 
I count those sets though. I don't count them as equal sets. So if I'm looking at volume totals for the week, I, I, don't, I wouldn't count a five by five with one minute rest period as five actual sets because I don't think it, it really works out if we're looking at overall volume total. And I still adhere to the general hypertrophy recommendations of about 12 to 20 sets over the course of a week, depending on what the client can get away with. So bearing all that in mind, I want to build um, across the week the right number of pressing uh, sets and chest sets and shoulder sets and everything for that client. So that'll be comprised of some direct variations, which will be the long standing one, which goes throughout, then some speed work, which will probably be counted as more like three working sets. Um, the max effort stuff, I generally don't even count as a set because I don't think it can be counted for hypertrophy. It's just for additional strength. And I just keep them on the low end of the 12 to 20 range. And that's really the main variable that I push. So in a sense, I'm borrowing quite heavily from the hypertrophy world to build them up for powerlifting because the majority of them need to be getting bigger as well as stronger. And that drives forward the adaptations. I do think the, the biggest lever you can pull when it comes to additional training stress is just doing more. So if you go from three sets to four, that's a massive increase. And that's far better right, for me and my clients. And it's far more um, measurable than trying to do things like um, special exercises, additional supersets, giant sets and whatnot, just a very measurable format. So I like to have things very sort of logical and mapped out. And over the course of the weeks, if we feel like the pressing isn't quite going in the right direction, perhaps the main assistance exercise isn't really pushing up as much as we'd like, we'll perhaps do another block where we'll repeat that variation and add some more volume if they're recovering well, see how that goes. So um, if we go to the, if, uh, let's say the first, the first block of a, a long bench cycle it might have its main assistance exercise as the incline close grip bench press, which is a great variation, but it's a much lighter variation of the bench. Now, if that incline close grip bench press didn't really go as planned, so let's say we went to three weeks, we didn't see the right kind of progress we would expect for somebody in their position, then we're looking at evaluating whether the client is um, fully recovered or not. If they are, we add some more work in, potentially add some more sets via assistance exercises or some kind of volume throughout the week, then see how it goes. So typically that, that generally tends to get things moving. The way, the way that I sort of determine whether to add more to take away uh, volume is if they're, if they're not progressing, but they're feeling fresh, I generally add more. If they're not progressing, they're feeling sore, I generally take some away, usually a sign they're not recovering well. So I want to leave every block with a good track record of saying, we improved on that variation. Now we can move on to the next one. So after the incline close grip bench, we'll typically come to the close grip bench. So I want to, I want to get to the close grip bench having made discernible, measurable progress on the incline close grip. Now I'm on the close grip for say three to six weeks. We do use the same methodology across those two or three blocks to say, okay, we're going to see some improvement here. So by the time we get to the actual, um, maybe the bench press for sets of eight, we're really strong at that movement. We've got lots of room. We've got built, we've built a great foundation. We've got room, lots of room to grow. Um, yeah, hopefully that makes sense. It's kind of oh, it a, does. It's a lot. Yeah, okay. Well, no, that's you have a cohesive system and it sounds like you... You have your order of operations in mind and uh, you, you know ahead of time exactly what you're going to change and when and what you look for. And that's if you don't have that laid out, you don't really have a system. That means you're just kind of winging it and hoping for the best. So that's all very useful. And it's funny, you think in terms of discrete blocks, the initial conjugate system uh, actually didn't rotate every week. It was actually special exercises directed block to block where it was, it was varying in specificity with the direction of getting, you know, more specific and getting more carryover to the actual contest date. Um, so, that, so that's very interesting. Uh, I wanted to ask about exercise selection. I like, I like that you acknowledge, and that kind of resonates with me, that doing more work is the easiest lever to pull because I think it actually absolutely is. And I think part of where people get lost with all of the potential levers you could pull is not really acknowledging how they rank in order of ease or, you know, how accessible it is to actually change that thing and predictably get a right, uh, a correct result. Exercise selection seems to me something that, and I mean, exercise selection. And as far as you are rotating in special exercises to get a specific result, it seems like when you do it right, it can be just monumental. If it's that thing that you need that targets that weak point, uh, it can lead to huge meteoric gains. And if you don't quite line it up right, it could be very underwhelming or even potentially detrimental. 
do you have just a consistent stable of exercises that you like? To what degree do you pick it apart for the individual? So um, if we if we sort of talk, for, I'll talk first about the um, the smaller exercises because that's a really simple um, one to, so we can cover that. Um, with the simple exercises, I don't actually think there's that much benefit to trying to target for really, really specific things. So if I'm just trying to make up the volume, I've got my speed work in or my volume work, I've got my main variation and I've got my max effort. You know, the extra itty bitty stuff that I might do with dumbbells or machines, even machines, I don't really mind about that too much. It's just, let's try and pick something which you're feeling fresh on and try and get better at it. But when it comes to the main variations, yeah, that's where there's a lot more selection. So with strength clients, I'm looking at evaluating um, body type, their lifts, where they get stuck at. It's a little bit like the discussion you and I had on, on Steve's um, podcast with Alex, and that was to do with uh, leverages. So from what I understood, you and Alex have very much a squatter and bencher type of physique. Uh, is that right? Would it fair to say? Yeah, little yeah. hobbit limbs. <laughs> so I, I have the long limbs, you know, and so I have the, the dinosaur sort of span, and uh, which makes me uh, a better deadlifter. So I think based on those reasons, there's different exercises which could be targeted. And it was kind of what I was saying at the end when you guys were speaking um, about the fact that I didn't get a great deal from getting stronger off the chest. My strengths really came in improving midway to the lockout because I just have far longer limbs and I really need to feel secure in the weight. Otherwise, I'm going to feel so shaky. It's not going to go very well. Same with the squat. I, if I don't feel secure on the walkout, the lift will fail, which sounds crazy from a raw squat perspective, but I need to feel strong on the way out and then I can squat it. With the bench press, if I feel strong on the lockout, I can usually bench it, um, which is odd. It's something you would prescribe to ascribe to uh, equip lifters, but that's generally how it works out for me. So when it comes to choosing main lifts, I'll base it on that. So let's look, look at where people are, are weak and let's get them stronger. It varies so much though, because like for me, because I was such a tricep dominant presser, um, it helped me just to get stronger and stronger on the close grip benches. I didn't get a great deal from what you might think would be logical. And that is to fill in the chest work because I was such a tricep dominant presser. One would think if I just built my chest up, it would give me a better balance. It wouldn't though. That what that would do is it would actually distort my leverages and distort my optimal pressing uh, path to the point where the lift wouldn't be very good. Years later, I did do that as a bodybuilder, and I nowadays I bench more with elbows out if I ever do bench, but that's on purpose. But as a powerlifter, particularly as a long limb powerlifter, I didn't want to do that. I was happy to bench wide, but my elbows still had to be tucked. Whereas for somebody like yourself, you may well respond to the maybe a the shoulders pinch back slightly higher. Um, elbows slightly wider, more upper back and trap development to cushion the raw bench with a higher chest rather than somebody like me who potentially wants their elbows tucked in a little bit more and touching a little bit lower. And you'll have different exercises for different things. Um, and it also comes into play in terms of, um, particularly for the bench press, looking at things like leg drive. Um, I think whenever, some, whenever people, somebody discovers leg drive, they get really obsessed with learning about it. I did when I was younger and it became the thing that I focused on. Uh, but it was useful for me. I was, I benched a little bit like Dan Green, but uh, for a lot of people, potentially for like yourself, you might not use a lot of leg drive because you're just so stocky. Um, so I, I don't know. It depends on, depends on, depends on what you, how you train, but I think I've got to evaluate the lifter based on just a bunch of factors. So it's all of those. So if I was to list them, it'd be all, everything I've said there, but really what I do is I just look at the lift and I have a sense for what needs work. And then there's an extra a dimension of like you get good at how you train it's like how many people do you know that just obviously look like they don't lift in the most mechanically optimal way yet they get extraordinarily good in spite of themselves because even disadvantaged positions have an extra quality of making you stronger and more muscular which in turn can make up for inefficiencies if that's where you're very comfortable and it's funny about the bench thing because that was kind of the start of my Hyper specific approach to lifting when I was younger. I started training, I don't know, when I was 13, took till I was about 16 before I had any sense of what I was doing. I want to say 17, 18, I started getting obsessed with strength specific work. So all my leverages were going to be optimized and I was going to do it the right way. And benching was the first one. So 2003, 2004, 2005, I'm pinching my shoulders. I'm getting this very narrow, like I'm trying to bench like Scott Mendelson. Mm. And I reduced my bench range. I'm not kidding down to about that far because I have a very long torso. So I had a lot of bench and I have real short arms and it was just a short little tricep lockout. It was like a five board bench. And I got to the point where 
God, I want to say I was 19 and I had a 400 pound bench. And I remember later on getting into not arguments, but having to explain myself to people at the bar because they didn't believe I benched what I said I benched because it was in the context of no physical development. So from the perspective of, Hey, trying to put up the biggest performance on the platform, if you can game the system with this, this really uh, specialized setup while also getting actually strong enough to be able to justify those bigger poundages, that's great. But in the, I think in the minds of most of, of the average trainees, that's, that it doesn't end up going that way. It ends up being too much one or the other. And then you end up just kind of picking a style and getting good at it. It was really refreshing to hear people talk about uh, Larson presses and uh, relaxing the shoulder blades when they bench. I got into it, re- not recently, it's probably a year or so ago with somebody, because I said, one of the big things that helped me out because my shoulders from all the overhead pressing I did take over everything. Like I, I bench with my delts, my pecs do very little. I have to spend a lot of work to get them up. And when they grow, my bench gets, it feels like I'm benching on a cloud. It's fantastic. So one of the ways I did that was I bench like a bodybuilder. I'd incorporate some guillotine presses at the end. I do my heavy work set with my shoulders, like rounded out just a little bit, elbows flared just a little bit, lo and behold, my chest grew. And it was like blasphemy. People are talking about, well, the shoulder joint isn't secure and you're going to cause injury and overuse. And it's one of those things that the, the real legit lifters kind of shit on. But when you incorporate, you're like, like, oh, wow, that, that got me, that got me pretty strong. If I got rid of my leg drive and, you know, had to do a little bit more with my upper body through a little more range, it's like, oh, holy crap. I, I actually grew a little bit. Yeah, that, that sort of that particular tip about letting the shoulders relax, that received a lot of press in the hypertrophy circles recently to a lot of coaches were saying, actually, you definitely should let your shoulders move back and forward. Like you definitely should. Um, and so it goes, it's funny how the internet just goes in swings and roundabouts. One way it'll be definitely don't do it. Then it'll be definitely do do it. When the truth is for some people, it's probably quite a good idea. For some people, it probably isn't in different circumstances. Sure. Yeah. But people love strong opinions. <laughs> I was going to say, it's like, that's, we can't have gray area. It's like, we're here to solve a problem. We need the answer. We need the answer fast. All right, Preferably I a, a fight afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> I got a couple of questions. Um, some of my audience and my subscribers uh, threw out a couple of questions that they are uh, interested in hearing your opinion on. Uh, we already covered a typical training day. You went well into progressions and splits and exercises. So that was really good. Um, uh, I have one question. And with your experience dealing with uh, bodybuilders and nutrition and all of that, mm-hmm. uh, I have a lot of people that want to know how to make, they want to do it all at once. They want to know how to get really jacked and also get really strong. So okay. in the face of significant weight loss, what tips do you have to maintain strength? Hmm. I think, well, okay. Significant weight loss. I'm thinking probably, uh, I, I class extreme weight loss in the region of say 70 plus pounds. Hmm. So I've been lucky to have coached, uh, about six people now to have lost 80 pounds or above. So I consider that to be extreme weight loss. Um, good weight loss, you know, good strong is probably 50 pounds and your average person, maybe 20, 30 pounds. That's kind of the categories I have. And it's because along the way, there are certain psychological uh, challenges. Now, what I would say is if you have a long-term strength, a long-term physique goal, where it, which involves dropping 70 to 80 pounds, take it in stages. Okay. And this is what matches up with your strength. Give yourself a 10% leeway, firstly. Okay. So however far you get down, 10% 10% strength loss is your cutoff. Now, and I only say this as a hard rule because you have to, again, communication language, you have to have some sort of boundaries. But in general, take 10% as the soft cap for where your strength loss is going to reside. Now, if you lose 10% off your bench, your squat, your deadlift, cut the diet, go to maintenance. Now, the maintenance will allow you to do two things. Firstly, it will allow you to recover some performance, which is crucial. You recover performance, you recover, you recover mass. But secondly, and that's a massive deal, then you can carry on your diet later. But secondly, you're also accomplishing something extremely useful, which people don't talk about often enough, which is practicing how to eat at maintenance. The majority of people who are overweight for the large portion of their life only have two modes, and that is diet mode, binge mode. Okay. That's not normal. Uh, Just to say, you know, and I realized that after, because I was heavy my whole life. And I actually was quite fat when I was a kid. Um, and then I became a bodybuilder and it, it sort of trimmed down and it got better. But um, that, that was my pattern as well. It was either just 
binge stuff my face because squat day is tomorrow or because you know i don't know whatever um uh it's late at night on a tuesday and i deserve donuts <laughs> so just for random reasons but i only had two modes of thinking it was either diet or it was binge and most people are in that sort of frame of mind so you have to learn to eat reasonably and that is eat at maintenance because once you become your lean thin self that is the majority of your life is eating roughly around maintenance, perhaps 200 above, 200 below, roughly where you're going to be at for the majority of your life. But you need to practice that. It is unreasonable to think that you can diet off 80 pounds, get to the rush to the physique that you want. And then somehow at that stage, you just magically know how to eat at maintenance and you can maintain that beautiful physique for the rest of your life. It doesn't happen. And, and get out of that way of thinking. It doesn't happen. Um, so, the, the maintenance breaks accomplish two things it's to re give you, give you muscle back, give you strength back, but also teach you how to eat at maintenance. And you can take as many of those as you need on the way down. And bear in mind, again, if it's a long-term project of losing 80 pounds, 70 pounds, hundred pounds, whatever it is, it doesn't have to be one long continuous cut. You can bulk in that process. It's okay. I have done it with clients. I've had them do short lean bulks to, so that the journey on the way down becomes uh, easier, it becomes um, less, yeah, it becomes easier for them. Also, it, they retain more muscle mass on the way down and it's just more fun. It's not nice to be dieting for a year. So you need a break. Otherwise, what happens is people tend to start slacking off on diets. They start cutting corners, whereas it used to be a two pound loss every week. Then it was a one pound loss every week. Then some weeks they kind of go off the diet, but psychologically, they're still on the diet. So psychologically speaking, they have all the mental physical toll of, of the, the diet fatigue of having been dieting for a year. Um, and that's how you get people who are perpetual dieters. They are just lifelong dieters. They, they identify with the diet all of a sudden. And we all know people like that. They're in this Karen from accounts at 40 and she's been dieting for the last 20 years. Hello, I'm Karen. I'm on a diet. It's, it's her entire personality. She's dieting every Monday morning. Oh, be back on a diet every Friday. Oh, back on a diet Monday. The, the usual type of thing. We all know those people. So Rather than do that and just fall into the habits that you develop, the bad habits that you develop, plan your training, plan your dieting, be strict on yourself with taking the maintenance periods. That will, in the end, accelerate your progress. It has never failed to help someone's fat loss progress if they've had specific maintenance breaks. And to answer your question again, that's how to mitigate the strength loss. That sounds great. And I have to imagine that most of the people that you deal with, uh, the psychological barriers are probably the biggest rather than the actual mechanism that gets the weight off. So it's more of like a kind of descending staircase where you, you go down and then you take a little plateau and then you go down again. And I, the few times I've dieted properly, I have done it. I do know what it's like. I just willfully reject it most of the time. Uh, I have noticed immensely. And this, these are the conversations where like, you think, you know, something, and then you talk to somebody who does it for a living and realize how stupid you are. I was talking to a, a bodybuilder friend of mine who she did nutrition and uh, nutrition work for a living. And she actually handled my wife's nutrition and it worked great. And I got to witness everything they did. And I was in the throes of dieting, doing it the way I do it, which is just kind of, it's like a rusted out lawnmower. It's just, it's rough and it's hard to get started. And it takes a lot of elbow grease to keep it going. It's just not smooth or clean whatsoever. And in telling her about it, I ended up feeding her the same bullshit that so many clients feed their coaches where I'm like, the weight just doesn't come off. I had to get the calories down to like 1200 for like four days before I saw the scale move. There's something about my metabolism. And of course she looks at me with one eyebrow raise, like I'm an idiot and has me spend a couple of days just eating the way a bodybuilder would eat. It's like, yeah. here's your clean food sources, eat every couple of hours, don't miss meals. And it was hilarious to watch as I actually fed myself and adhered to a schedule where they had the macros worked out. Yeah. I was hungrier more often and the weight came off faster and I wasn't seeing the strength dive in the gym and those maintenance steps make so much sense. Cause I'm sure after several hard weeks of dieting, mm. it just, it's not long enough to get you fat, but it's certainly yeah. long enough to refuel you, pick your mental edge up. And like you said, teach you how to eat normally. It's um, crucial. The associations that people get are probably the, the worst when, like you said, just being a perpetual year round dieters. And now your idea of dieting is this painful thing you're obligated to do every day and you don't like it. And it doesn't work anyways, but you have to do it because you're fat and you're not happy. And it's, uh, it's just a mess. 
yeah, hundred percent. Couldn't agree more. Um, I think I think so, the I think social media has and and the internet in general hasn't done us any favors when it comes to this kind of thing because we tend to get a lot of very hard and heavy headlines which aren't necessarily that helpful, particularly over the last ten years. I and mean, you'll remember this, Alex. Ten years ago, if you weren't eating protein pop tarts and doing five by five, you were just insane. You know, you, were you even serious? Um, so it, it just, we've sort of ridden this wave of the whole if it fits your macros and every, every diet trend really. And I think we're starting to come back to at least some semblance of normality, but um, yeah, I, I, I do, I do have some sort of tips and tricks when it comes to fat loss, some peculiarities, but the majority of it is just what I call bodybuilding nutrition. Cause I feel it's the best way to, to have fast, to have fat loss. What I posted on my Instagram a while back was the model of fat loss that I use. I call it the helicopter analogy of fat loss. Okay. And it's this idea that the further you are away from the goal, as in the higher up in the air you are, the faster you can come down. And in the same way with the diet, if you have a lot of weight to lose, initially you can lose that very fast. And, and I have what, what I call my fastest fat loss method, which is basically a PSMF that I teach to my clients who want to come to me for very quick weight losses. And typically you're looking at something like 25-ish pounds in the first six weeks if you execute it correctly, with the promise being that you're probably not going to be that hungry. You probably will hate the diet somewhat uh, by the end because it's very repetitive, but you're not going to be hungry, which is a big plus when you're dieting. Um, so it, the quick weight losses are something which I believe in quite strongly, if they're set up correctly. There is a large 60-year body of research around quick diets. They're called, in the research, they're called LCDs, low-calorie diets, or VLCDs, very low-calorie diets. And there's a long history of those which support the, the fact that they do tend to lead to better long-term outcomes, which I find really fascinating. Um, the, the idea that a quick weight loss in the beginning of a diet will actually lead to better adherence and better long-term outcomes is well proven now in the research going back 60 years. It's undeniable at this stage. And in what I've seen, if it's executed correctly, it can be done in a healthy way as well, a way which supports your muscle mass. So it's an option. It's not what I do with every client, but I certainly give them the option because it initially leads to a lot of weight loss. Like I have one client right now, Lee, shout out to Lee if he's listening. In two weeks, he's dropped about six kilos. Now we all know that's a lot of water. It's a lot of glycogen. We get it, of course. But psychologically, it's very, very, exactly. It's very gratifying for him. He's like, wow, I look completely different. I look all shrunken in. The weight comes off your belly quite a lot because it's all the water you hold. Those kind of guys hold, tend to hold a lot around the stomach. And he's on the right track. He knows he only has another, say, 10 kilos to lose. So that's a big loss. It's 35 pounds. But psychologically speaking, he's a lot better off. Sorry. Sorry, phone. Just ignore that. Um, but psychologically speaking, he's a lot better off. So it's it's really good. Um, so, but it, as I say, that's where I start. So I, I use this analogy of the helicopter model of fat loss. You go down quick at the beginning if you have enough to lose, and then you really slow it down. Because when you get to say anywhere between 20 to 10%, you have to slow things down quite a lot. Um, otherwise, bad things happen. <laughs> well, yeah. It's like watching old episodes of The Biggest Loser. When you had people who were 500 pounds, you would get 15 pounds off in a week. You would get 20 pounds off in a week. Um, which obviously is not sustainable as you get lighter. Yeah. Um, that's interesting about starting off fast and leveling out as you go. I'm reminded of a client who I could not get to adhere to a diet to save her life. Just every complex you could have around eating imaginable she had. And she would come in, she'd work very hard a couple of times a week, but the conversation had to go like, you know, two to three training sessions a week isn't enough to make up for your shitty eating habits. So, you know, let's get our goals in line and figure out what strategies we can use to make this uh, a more successful endeavor. And I remember specifically this one client had successfully at one point done, I think it's the HCG diet where oh God. <laughs> they administer HCG and go on like four or 500 calories a day yeah. for an extended period of time. And something about the hormones, I don't know if it's right. protein sparing or something like that or, okay. or muscle sparing, but yeah. it, I, all the excess just gets burned from excess body fat. And right. um, it's just a caveat is like, how long can you go eating four or 500 calories a week? Yeah. And it just boggled my mind. Like you could do this really extreme thing for this short period of time. But when trying to get out of that really manic and kind of crazy method of living uh, and, and do something normal, 
that it was almost like, well, now you have to go all the way back to, uh, to those toxic habits. And I guess that just goes back to having the unhealthy relationship with food and not knowing what the middle ground is and what that actually looks like. Yeah. I think, I think a large part of it is relearning habits. That's what I've discovered is the big thing with fat loss. And it's the big thing with coaching because you're on their case for a protracted period of time, which allows them to build the habits and solidify them. Getting a coach really is the shortcut to getting these habits in place. And so if you're, if you've got some, typically I have better results with people who are younger because when you're young, you just don't have that many years cultivating shit habits. Whereas with a guy who's 40, 50, 60 years old, he's got generations of these crap habits, which are in play and you're having to overturn them. And it takes a lot longer, but that's really it. Now, when it comes to sort of losing fat, um, I have three distinct sort of methods and well, not methods, but really ways of measuring diet, uh, if that's something you want to talk about. So I think macros is quite useful. Um, I think um, meal plans are quite useful, um, depending on the circumstance. But I also like more of an intuitive habit-based approach. So I've, I've, sort of been, I've had my obsessions with all three over the course of the last 20 years. I've been obsessed with the macro thing back in early on. Uh, I can remember doing macros on my calendar as a 17-year-old kid um, before my fitness pal and just writing them all in. But I've also been quite obsessed with the whole meal plan stuff, which I think is good. And then also the relatively recent habit-based way of eating, which um, is quite cool. But so I, I use all three with clients and it kind of depends on the circumstance. But um, what, what about you? Do you have any kind of preference? Uh, dieting stuff. And I, I've been upfront uh, to people on the channel and I'm also upfront with my clients. I'm most comfortable dealing with people who either have a lot of fat to lose where it comes down to simple execution of a few basic things. And I'm very big about learning to eat like a normal human being, learning to take accountability for what you eat. You don't have to have a advanced degree in nutrition in order to execute a normal, healthy diet. And on the other end, I'm very comfortable with uh, athletes who are pretty in tune with their body and already have a, a good base. I don't pretend to be able to diet somebody down to a bodybuilding show uh, or even I do. And I'll admit, I get a little gun shy when somebody's trying to walk the edge of a weight class. At that point, I'm like, look, I can write you out a bodybuilding diet where you're going to eat the same five things day in, day out. And the macros are going to be very rote and mechanical. And you have to mold yourself to this. But that leaves very little wiggle room if there are, um, you know, there's life stuff that comes into it, personality stuff. People will struggle with that for a whole host of reasons. And that's where I've seen, I have a lot more respect for nutritionists because over time you get, like you said, you go through these phases of being obsessed, but you get a handle on all of these different mechanisms that might have to be implemented in different proportions based on the individual you're working with. Generally, I start with food selection because it's the easiest thing. It's just hard to overeat on lean meat and low calorie yogurt and rice based stuff uh, and vegetables. And if they adhere to that, and that's a big if, because that's the other aspect. We can talk about what works, but I'm always faced with the question, will they do it or how do I get them to do it? But assuming they do that, that's a big part of it. And then over time, I always push just titration, just do the same thing long enough where you get an, an idea of what a normal uh, routine is like. And when you do that, it's extremely easy to make a little adjustments, chart how it affects you, and then go from there. Yeah, it's, I've, I've seen what would be perfectly reasonable approaches just be rejected by people um, just because it doesn't fit their personalities. And every one of those approaches has got their strong, fierce proponents, but also opponents online. Um, and that's a funny area actually we should talk about is the, the general sort of nutrition um, quackery online, which is uh, probably almost as strange as the, uh, the, the weight training quackery. But uh, yeah, I've, I found even for a simple habit-based approach, the levels of adherence for some people, it can be not strict enough. And so they're just, they're sat there thinking, I need more direction. Um, or with calories, it's just too much. It's too restricting. Uh, or with meal plan, people, some people love it. They think it's fantastic. And um Whereas other people would look at it as a dinosaur way of doing things. But um, yeah, I, I think it's just a case of individualizing it to the, to the person. And it's usually a combination of all three anyway. But um, yeah, interesting stuff. Mm. Oh, absolutely. absolutely. And it's necessary, I mean, to anybody that wants to take this far enough. Everybody wants to look good. And that's a big factor. If you're not naturally a hard gainer, then uh, you have to pay attention to what you eat and balance that with what is required to grow. 
Um, and I mentioned earlier, a big problem I have is, and I think it's coming into a new form of body dysmorphia where instead of you had, um, I forget the name they had it, uh, bigorexia, where you had guys right. who just going the rich piano route, just trying to get bigger and bigger and more freakish. Now you have the opposite in uh, powerlifters who want to look like ninjas and, <laughs> you know, they have no respect for anybody who grows a muscle. It's all, uh, how do I have the most horsepower given my very sleek, small frame? Okay. And it's, uh, it, it's, it's tricky, but yeah, everybody is best off if they have an understanding of their eating, they know how to manipulate things over time. And uh, when it comes to coaching, I mean, that's a, that's a skill <laughs> dealing with clients on that threshold, anything that has to do with getting people to engage personal habits, be out of their comfort zone, do new things. It, it definitely takes a skill. I have a lot of respect for that. Uh, Faz, go ahead and let people know where they can get in contact with you. All right, folks. Um, so I am on YouTube. Uh, I'm on Instagram. Also, my podcast, Faz Lifts, uh, is on pretty much every major platform. Um, for my podcast, I do a lot of just uh, more thoughtful stuff, I guess. With the YouTube, it's very much directed at diet and training. Um, but yeah, um, follow along. Uh, say hello. We'd, we'd love to chat to people. <laughs> All right. This was great. Thank you for stopping by, man. I had a blast. I really enjoyed it. Thank you very much. Yeah, we'll do it again. All right, everybody, go ahead and give Faz Lifts a follow. Until next time, this is Bromley. I'll see you.